All right. Uh, yeah, welcome to Houdini Training Day at SIGGRAPH 2016. Woo woo! Um, how many people here are familiar with Houdini and the interface, users? How many are not, are new to Houdini completely? Awesome, look at this. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. Um, so I just want to kind of outline what's going to happen verbally a little bit here first. Uh, so this course is called, or this lesson, whatever, is called uh, Houdini Concepts. And there's two of them. There's this one and the one right after this is Houdini Concepts 2. Um, they're both me. I may take a, you know, bio break in between. I suggest you all do the same. But we're going to cover uh, things from the ground up that are just basic core concepts for Houdini. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time, obviously, to us to cover all of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with two basic concepts. The first one is just the idea of attributes. What an attribute is, we're going to talk about it. We're going to show you in the interface how you can use it to manipulate geometry and make some kind of cool effects happen. Uh, that'll be the first hour. So it's going to be part lecture and then part in the interface. Feel free to follow along if you do have a Houdini or take notes or whatever. We, I know we're recording this as well, so it'll be available, so that's awesome. Um, the second one that we're going to do today, right after this one, is going to be about voxels. We're going to talk about the concept of what a 3D pixel is, because that's really all a voxel is. It's a three-dimensional pixel. Um, and again, we'll go through a little bit of lecture, and then we'll jump into the interface and start making some cool stuff happen. So, you guys ready? Give me a big wahoo yay. Yeah, now we're having fun. All right. So, I am John Moncrief. I am the curriculum manager for Pluralsight CDE. Pluralsight uh, has recently acquired a company called Digital Tutors. I was a Digital Tutors fanboy from day one. Um, and so we recently have rebooted our entire Houdini learning path. Like everything in Houdini in our training library uh, has begin, become a big focus for us recently. So we're very proud of it and that's why we're here today. So there's about me. So let's talk a little bit more about what an attribute is. Now, an attribute is something that you have in your everyday life as well as something that you have in Houdini. Everything can have attributes. You use them all the time. Basically, you can call them uh, adjectives, if you want to think about it that way. If you're a language guy, think about attributes as adjectives. So that looks delicious. That is a wonderful breakfast of champions right there, in my opinion. Um, but we can describe this in many different ways. And there's many different elements to this particular dessert, if you will. And each of those elements could be thought of as an attribute or a descriptor, something that describes an element of that dessert, right? So you've got many different things that you could use to describe that dessert overall, right? The dessert has attributes. It has a flavor attribute that we might call sweet. It has a calorie or caloric attribute. And you might say, well, it's got 8,000 of those, right? So it's got 8,000 calories. Well, all you've done there is you've created an attribute for your dessert and you're giving it a number, a value that helps describe what that item is. Same thing with taste, size, color. So all of those things are attributes of that dessert, right? Well, you can also break it down another step. And you can say, well, there's other elements of that dessert that make up that dessert. For instance, there's the cracker. The cracker has its own separate individual attributes that help describe what it is. So you have like a moisture attribute for the cracker. You'd say, well, it's a dry cracker. Right? You also have a crunch factor for that particular cracker. Some crackers might be soggy, so they would have a less of a crunch factor. Well, that just means that the value of the crunch attribute would be a little bit less. So it's just a way of thinking about how attributes work on, like in the real world, and then being able to take that concept and kind of cross-apply it over to how Houdini looks at attributes. Because it's really nothing more than this. It's just little pieces of information that have a name and a value, and we're assigning them to different parts of our geometry inside of the scene. So let's go ahead and fire up Houdini, and we'll start to look at how we see these attributes in the interface. And that'll help a little bit, uh, I think, explain it. We'll come back to the PowerPoint in just a second. So let me fire up my file here. Here we go. So this is Houdini. Don't be afraid of it. For those of you that haven't been in it, can you see the screen? Can everybody see the screen all right? Yeah, yeah. Turn off the lights, there was an idea. Break out the fog machine and the disco ball. Hey, it's midnight somewhere, right?
So I'm going to go ahead. We'll just I'll, I'll talk through this. We won't do anything too detailed in the interface until we figure out a, the contrast lighting thing. Um, do what? Somebody have a what's happening behind the door? Oh. Did not blow up. However, all of you taking notes are now in trouble. All right, if they make us change it out later. We'll change it out later. So, uh, I'm going to start with just, uh, just as a comment. Don't worry about trying to write down every move that I make in the interface. For those of you that are just, like I said, unfamiliar with Houdini. It's way more about kind of paying attention to um, not what buttons I click, but the concepts that are being taught behind them. So just check out the screen. So I'm going to create just a box. We'll do it from the shelf here. So there's a box, right? No big deal. We're all familiar with a box. Well, that box is going to be the equivalent of what our s'mores was when we looked at that big s'mores that was up on the screen. And we said, yeah, we can describe that s'mores as dessert. And yeah, this is great. It looks like church camp. Somebody's getting kicked out of the back of the bus here. This is awesome. Um, so the idea is that this, this box has a set of attributes that apply to it. And you can see those attributes in what's called the geometry spreadsheet. And when you look over at the geometry spreadsheet, we have all these different ways of viewing the information that we use to describe that box. Those are attributes. So it's the same type thing. So if we look over here at these four different options that we have, the way that we looked at it before was we had an a, uh, overall attribute we called the dessert. And we said, yeah, it was sweet, it was high in calories, it had a particular calorie count. In Houdini, that's something that we would call a detail attribute. We also looked at, when we broke down the elements, we said, okay, we, we have the cracker, and the cracker itself could be crunchy, right? Well, that is something that we could call a point attribute. So when we think about a piece of geometry, this geometry is made out of different elements, right? There's the entire box, then there's also these points, which we can turn on here, these little blue dots on the corners, so those are points. We also have these edges that make up the distance between those points, and when we get three or more of them together, we have these things called uh, primitives, and each of those can have their own set of attributes. So just like we had the graham crackers, the marshmallows, the different things that made up the s'mores, we have all these different things that make up this particular box, and all of them have attributes. Uh, one way of being able to look at those is to create some attributes, and we can add our own to these different elements. So let's dive inside of this box here. So now we're looking under the hood of the box, and we're looking at all of these components that make up that particular box. Well, Houdini doesn't really put on a bunch of false attributes at the beginning of creation of geometry. In fact, it doesn't give you any except for position. So when we look back at our geometry spreadsheet here, again, this is just a way, think of it as like an Excel spreadsheet sort of that holds the attribute data for that box, okay? So the only thing that we have in our list right now is this P right here, and all that is is the position. So we can't have a box unless we have these points that exist in a particular place in three-dimensional space, right? So this is point number zero here, and it exists on the x-axis at 0.5 units over. And all these are, are different directions or locational uh, attributes, if you will, for those points that we saw that make up the box. We can see those very directly. Coming back here, we'll turn on this little thing called point numbers, and we can see now that each of these individual points has a number associated with it. This particular one is three, right? So we have all of the points. We can look at point number three here, and let's go back to the geometry spreadsheet, and we can see here we have this list of uh, numbers down the left-hand side. Well, there's point number three right there. Its point attributes are described right here as negative 0.5 in X, 0.5 in Y, and 0.5 in Z, okay? Pretty, pretty easy, pretty easy to understand. Well, we have the ability to actually add attributes if we want. So I can come in here and just lay down a color node. Come on, mouse, you can do this. There we go. 
And now that I've added a little bit of color to it, we'll make it something kind of garish here, this scary green. We'll go back and look at our scene view. Now we have this green cube, right? Well, why is the cube green? Well, it's green because we've just added another attribute to that piece of geometry. The attribute we added was color. We can see that back in the geometry spreadsheet here because now not only do we have these three P attributes, X, Y, and Z that we talked about, but now we also have this CD attribute. And CD is just, think of it as shorthand for color, right? CD equals color. So here we have R, G, and B, red, green, and blue values that are assigned to the points that make up that piece of geometry. That's why we now have color on our box. So that's all that an attribute is. Well, attributes are kind of cool. Not only can you actually use them to add information like color or position, which we've looked at before, but you can actually use those different attributes on other elements inside of your geometry. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off with a very simple piece of geometry. I'm just going to get rid of my box here. So we'll just delete that. And we'll look at this uh, very first thing here. Here we go. Is just a cylinder. Let me uh, look inside my network here. Where's my nodes? There they are. So what we've got is very simply a tube. It's just a simple tube piece of geometry. It was made uh, using the shelf button, just laid down a simple tube. And if we look over here in the geometry spreadsheet, we can see that we don't have any attributes on this geometry at all. We just have the basic position of the points, like we already discussed. In X, Y, and Z, each of the points on that tube have a location. And that's all the attributes that it has right now at this point. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about how we transfer attributes from one piece of geometry over to another and then use that to drive uh, rotation and scale and position of that second piece of geometry. So the other thing that's in the scene right now, other than just that tube, is this sphere. Okay? And again, the sphere is uh, a primitive. We can look over here. We see we've just got a single point position that gives, it tells us where that sphere is. It's only made up of a single point. That's perfectly fine. Let's uh, jump back here. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a little interface switcheroo so we can see the geometry spreadsheet at the same time that we're seeing uh, the elements in the, in the scene view here. So I'm just going to split this view, split this left, right, and I'll turn this scene view over here into the geometry uh, spreadsheet. So now we can see both at the same time. It'll keep from bouncing back and forth. It's just a little more efficient way to work. So we have our sphere. And then I have this transform node, and all the transform node does is it moves the sphere around. So the sphere just goes from the top of the scene to the bottom of the scene. No big deal. Now I can also see here over here, I can template this tube so I can see both. So we know that the sphere is moving from the top of the tube down through the bottom of the tube. Great. Very simple. So what we want to do is add some color to each of those pieces of geometry. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a color attribute to both the sphere and the tube. So we'll go ahead and turn this, uh, the sphere red. As soon as we do, you can see here in the geometry spreadsheet that we do now have this CD attribute. And it's uh, X, Y, and Z here. Uh, basically, it's using X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's really RGB. When I created the vector, I just set it up as X, Y, Z. You can do it either way. It doesn't matter. It's just an attribute that describes three values for red color, green color, and blue color. Right now, we've got a red sphere, so our red channel is at one, so we have a perfectly red sphere. Over here on the tube, we're going to go through and add some color, only that color is going to be a black color. And here you can see that we have no value in red, green, or blue for any of the points in that piece of geometry. So they still have an attribute, right? They have a color attribute, it's just that the value of the color attribute is zero in, both, in all three channels, red, green, and blue. Piece of cake. Everybody with me? Questions? Anything so far? We're about to do the fun part. Everybody's like, do the damn fun part. All right. Here's the damn fun part. The damn fun part is that we use this node called an attribute transfer. And what it allows you to do is, like I said, take a piece of information from one piece of geometry and push it over to another piece of geometry. Now what we've done here is we've said, okay, I want to take the color information from that sphere and I want you to be able to push it over into the tube. So as we play now, you can see that we've got this sort of gradient of color that's moving through the tube. 
Now I can go ahead and template that sphere so you can get an idea of exactly where it is and what's happening. So there's the sphere. The sphere is red. It has its red color. And it's pushing that red color over into the tube. So what we've got is this series of values that's changing as the, as the sphere moves through the tube. And you can see that update here in the geometry spreadsheet, too. Remember, these uh, numbers down the side refer to those points that are actually on that tube. So each of, that, each of the points on that tube, we can turn on point numbers. It'll be a little dense. Zoom in here. But so point number 416, for example. If we scroll down through the list and find point number 416 and watch its red value, you can see its red value change and correlate exactly to the timing of the change of color on the tube. So there we go. We're actually now using the color of one object and transferring it over to another. You go, great, well that's a cool setup. That's really neat and all, John, but what the hell are we gonna do with it now? Let's come down and start looking at the next phase of this. So the very next phase of this is that we're gonna take that attribute which is a color attribute of the tube, which, uh, turn the point numbers off so you can see that a little better. And we're going to move the color attribute from the tube, and we're going to take it and upgrade it, if you will, or just change what it's describing. So before, when we looked at the s'mores, we looked at the crackers and we said, yeah, those crackers are crunchy, and they're a crunch factor of 10, right? And we looked at the marshmallow and we said, yeah, well, the marshmallow is gooey, and maybe it's got a gooey factor. But what if we wanted to use the crunch factor of 10 of the cracker and say, I want the marshmallow's gooeyness to be the exact same as the crunch factor on the cracker. So I'm going to take something that describes the cracker, and I'm going to use it to actually describe how that marshmallow is gooey. So in other words, if the cracker becomes a crunch factor of 5, the marshmallow will now be gooey of 5 as well. So you're just taking that information from one piece of the dessert, or in this case, our geometry, and you're using it to describe another completely different element of that piece of geometry, right? So what we're doing here is we're just promoting that attribute up. Let me uh, turn on my parameters view here. And now, let me sneak down here. Again, don't be too concerned about exactly where I am in the network right now, because what we're talking about is more important. The concepts of what we're talking about is more important. So let me change my display here so we can see our background just a little bit better. We'll go from dark and use this wonderful gradient here so we can see. So these are all of the points that exist on that tube. And right now, they're still black. Here's where our attribute transfer is, and we're using it to push that red color through to those points. You can see it now that the points are still changing color, but we're looking at just those points. Now we're going to take those points, and I'm going to actually copy onto those points some grids, okay? Think about this as uh, the way that you would look in another piece of software and say uh, every piece of geometry is made up of faces. Like when we looked at our tube, our tube had a bunch of different uh, primitives or faces on it. Well, all we've done here is we've said for each of those individual faces, I want to be able to control the value of those faces. Okay, so I'm just copying onto those individual points these individual tiny little grids. So I'm basically just making up my own faces for that tube at this point. All right. So, one thing that we do have the ability to do here that's pretty cool, we'll go ahead and rewind this. Now we understand the construction of that geometry. We can see exactly how that geometry is being built. We've taken a grid, we've copied it onto the individual points, and we're going to start playing with those attributes again and having one attribute on one thing drive the other. So just so you understand the construction of the geometry and where we're headed. Turn off this guy. We'll dive in here. Zoom back out a little. So, this is kind of the effect that we're gonna, we're gonna go for. And what we've actually got here is that color information driving the position, rotation, and scale of those individual grids that I copied onto the points. And I'll show you how that breaks down in the network. It'll help explain a little bit exactly where this is coming from here. So, does that affect, can you see how this effect here relates back to the video that we saw? Oh, media player. Who loves Windows? Round of applause. Oh, that's weird, okay. Um, so, 
this, this is basically the origin of how the effect that we saw when we saw the really cool dancer when those faces were flipping and spinning around to change from one uh, look to another look. This is the exact technique that, well, it's not the exact technique. It's a technique. It's a way of being able to produce that particular effect. So let's talk a little bit more about those attributes and how all that stuff is working. So here we have our attribute transfer that we saw before. We know that our color is transferring from one to the other. Cool. We come down here to this copy node. And on the copy node, again, this is where I'm taking those individual little grids and putting them on those points. Well, what we've done, let's expand this just a little bit here, is look right here inside of this lift uh, value. Well, I've given the lift, uh, I created a new variable, if you will, think of it that way, and I said, okay, here's this piece of data called lift, and I need something to drive the value of lift. Well, here we have this CDR driving lift, okay? This is the red color. So I've taken that red color attribute and the value of that red color attribute for each point, I actually put it into its own little variable and called it lift. So you can see as the color moves through the tube, the red sections here underneath are the ones that are being pushed. Okay, so we're using that red color attribute to actually push the position of those faces. Now, the way that that's done here is in this transform node. This particular transform node uses something called copy stamping. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later in the day uh, when we get into procedural modeling. Uh, it's a little, I can't remember exactly what time the procedural modeling one is, it's in the afternoon. But we're gonna talk about uh, copy stamping and procedural design and procedural uh, thinking. But for right now, as far as we're talking about attributes and how we use attributes, you can see here that, um, oh, hang on, I got the wrong. Wrong thing, it's in the peak. I lied to you, please don't hold it against me. Uh, the peak node is actually what's pushing that geometry away from its source. We're basically just saying, whatever position you exist in right now, you can't see my hand, whatever position you exist in right now, I wanna push you away from that position in a particular direction. Well, no big deal. If we look inside of this uh, little expression that's in here, we'll see there is that lift variable that we just discussed. So. It's using that red color value that's plugged into the variable lift. Then it takes that, puts it into the peak node, and says, okay, whenever I start to turn red, push me away. Just push me away a little bit. And we know from our attribute spreadsheet, when we look at the color transfer on the grid, scan over here just a little bit. Wrong spot of the network. Here we go. Uh, there's our red value right here. Well, that actual physical number of 7.57504, that is the, the distance that's being put into that lift variable that's pushing those points away. So it's actually literally taking the number, it's just math, it's just taking the number of the value of the red color and using it to slowly push those points away. Now, there's a little bit of a gradient that happens, which is why you get the really cool sort of blending effect. As the color transfers through the points, we look at just the color here, we know it doesn't, they don't pop on red and pop off black, right? The distance from where the sphere is in its proximity to the tube, it's a gradual transition. Well, what that does is it allows us to slowly and gradually, incrementally push those points away based on that color. So as it becomes more and more red, it gets further and further away. So it's not just in the peak. The thing is, is you can use this anywhere in Houdini. This concept of creating a variable and using an attribute, in other words, color, we're primarily just working with color here, right? You can use it to drive all kinds of different things. In fact, almost any parameter and any point inside the Houdini interface can be driven this way using attributes. Um, we have another one here called spin. Well, we have one little adjustment to this. CDR, we know, goes from zero to one. We can see that happening right here in our uh, geometry spreadsheet. And as it goes from zero to one, I wanna be able to push something in 360 degrees instead of in just one degree. So I'm just multiplying that value by 360. And we call it spin. 
Well, I have a transform node. In my transform node, I say, okay, cool, let's use that to drive this rotational information of that particular face. And as we do, that's what's causing these nodes, or I'm sorry, these uh, faces to spin as they become more and more red. So that's it. That's really the gist of the concept of attributes and how you can use one attribute to actually drive another element. Now, that's not the absolute end of what you can do with attributes. You can do just about anything in the world with attributes. Um, I want to play this cool little second video for you guys here. We have a uh, new course that's coming out, which is really, really, really cool. Um, it's a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Granskog, and he takes this concept of using attributes and uses them inside of the VEX programming language to build procedural tree systems. And it's really pretty fancy pants. It's really, really neat. I want to play you guys the trailer just so you get an idea of how using these attributes throughout the interface can drive some really cool, neat effects. So just check it out for just a second. Here. Hey everyone, my name is Jonathan Granskog and welcome to my course called Designing Vex Driven Digital Assets. I have been a Houdini user for over four years now and uh, I noticed that more of my projects I'm going to actually stop at this particular point right here and ask right now, does anybody have questions? I know it's a lot of information and it went really fast. I can go back to any point inside of the network. We can break stuff open and you can kind of guide. If you have any questions, let me know where you want to go and we'll discuss more. So who's got questions? I know there's got to be more questions than that. Okay, anybody, go ahead. Uh, yes, we can definitely do that. I think what you're asking, let me see and make sure. So let's go ahead and do something like this. We'll split the pane. So do you mean just to be able to have like two pieces of geometry like this? So you can see the attributes on one and the other at the same time? Oh, cool. Cool, a cool GUI question. All right, yes sir. Yes, 100%. Oh, that's true. Uh, the question was, could we dive inside of the attribute transfer node and just kind of talk a little bit about how the information of the attributes goes from one piece of geometry to the other? Did I get that right? Okay, cool. Um, so here's the actual attribute transfer node. Let's go ahead and uh, look at what's happening right on this node. Um, now hang on, wait a minute. Let me ask you this first. Do you mean, like, talk about how the attribute transfer node is written? Because if that's the case, I'm going to need to get an engineer in here. <laughs> like, I'm not that guy. I don't code nodes. That's not exactly where, where that happens. Um, so the attribute transfer node itself, we can start to talk a little bit about the parameters, and maybe that'll help. Uh, coming in uh, to Houdini Fresh, it's good to know this little tip and trick. Anytime that you see these little nubbies on these nodes that have little arrows in or out on them, you can middle click on them and it'll tell you exactly what's going on. So I can middle click on this one and see that this is my input number one and what it's asking me for is the geometry that I wanna transfer the attribu attributes to. Well, the one on the right hand side, if we middle click on it is, where do you wanna get those attributes from? So on the right hand side of the node, this incoming piece of geometry is my sphere, right? It's my red sphere. That's effective, right? Boop. Okay. Uh, the left-hand side is, of course, the black-colored tube points that we're, that we're working with. So what I'm doing is I'm taking that red color from this right-hand side, which is the red sphere, and then I'm plugging in the piece of geometry on the left-hand side that I want to push that information over to. And so let me go ahead and template the sphere so you can see the position that'll help. So there's the position of the sphere here. Let's collapse this guy out. So this uh, sort of red outline represents the position of where the sphere is and the points of the tube. So now as that sphere moves through the tube, you can see that, yeah, we're taking the information from that right input of the attribute transfer, 
And then the magical geniuses at SideFX have figured out how to make this node do this. Um, it's pushing that color over into those points because that points are what's in the left-hand side of the input of that node. Now, you do have some options here. The reason that we have that gradient, we kind of talked about that gradation that's based off of distance. As the sphere gets closer and closer and closer to those points, the color uh, transfers over in a gradual state. Well, you have the ability to change that here with this distance threshold and blend width. So the distance threshold basically says, I'm going to look at the distance between the two things that I'm transferring attributes between and calculate that and use that as part of my uh, projection of one attribute, of one piece of geometry onto the other. If we turn that off, it doesn't matter. Like, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be distance based. Uh, that sphere can exist anywhere in my scene that I want it to. It could be 100 billion miles away. As long as I've got it plugged into that attribute transfer, if I turn off the ability to calculate distance and use distance, uh, to transfer the attribute, it's going to take that attribute and put it over on that other piece of geometry, regardless of where it is in the scene. So what the distance threshold does is, yeah, it looks and it goes, okay, here's the point position of the red attribute on one item, and here's the point position of the other item that's going to receive the red attribute. I'm going to look at the distance between the two, and as one you know, gets closer, it's going to gradually take that distance information and use it to adjust the level of the attribute transfer. And the blend width is basically, um, it's like a blur. It's basically, think about it like a filter or a Gaussian blur. I don't know if it's actually a Gaussian blur or if I'm even saying that word right still. Um, but what it allows you to do is sort of change the spread of how that attribute is actually transferred over to those other pieces of geometry. So uh, the way that it was before, when it moves through, the bloom that we get is sort of this... Uh, sort of the, this wide girth, this big bloom that happens. We can change how much that bloom is by looking at that attribute transfer node and changing that blend width. So as I change that blend width, I'm actually changing how all of that information is pushed through the system and drives other elements, right? So we talked about how we're driving a peak node and a transform node to spin those things around. Well, you have the ability to change that and sort of really craft, go in there and hone and craft how you want the look of that to be. And again, if we turn off our distance threshold, what's the result? Boop. We're not calculating distance anymore. We're just looking at it and we're going, yeah, every point on that attribute transfer, or the attribute transfer has told me every point on that piece of geometry, make it red. Well, since red's driving the position, rotation, and, and whatever of these other pieces of geometry, as soon as it goes all red, boop, everything explodes. Does that help at all sort of answer how that's happening? You can say no. <laughs> um, Cool. Now, as, like I said, as far as how that particular node, like, I, you can't, I can't dive inside of the attribute transfer. Like, from a user interface standpoint, uh, me, uh, it's not something that we're, we can go into how that code is written in VEX and start manipulating the code. Can that be done? Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Now you're thinking procedurally. That's exactly the concept. That's it. That's it. You can take anything. We could take... If we look back at the geometry spreadsheet for just a second, let me change this guy back over. We know that we have uh, color and we have position. I mean, you can make up your own attributes. They don't even have to be functional. You can actually go in there and say, I want an attribute and call it avocado, right? So now you've got an avocado attribute and you put a value in it. Well, you can now use that anywhere that you want inside the interface to drive any property of any piece of geometry. So it's completely open as to how you want to do it. It's, it's a similar concept, man, you can, the side effects people are gonna kill me. If anybody's familiar with the basic, very clunky, hidden in a bunch of crazy rollouts and annoying to use set-driven key concept, think about it kind of like that, only an open box version of it that you have control over. You have the power to be able to use those attributes however you want. Um, other hands, yes sir. Oh, sure, 100%. It's, uh... Oh, right. Uh, we want to see how the color information is actually being piped into the attribute transfer node. So let's talk about that. Here is the actual sphere that we're starting with. And this transform, all it does is push that sphere around. Um, I used a little expression here that uses the frame number. 
and the frame number is actually what's driving the animation. There's no keyframes on it. So you could think of that as another way of sort of attributes, but it's not geometry attributes. Never mind, I didn't say that. So we're just moving the sphere around. The next thing that happens is we have this attribute create node, okay? Now the attribute create node is where we actually add the color to the sphere. Now before I used a node called the color node, right? So let's, let's dive into this, this is kind of neat. So the color node, unlike the attribute transfer, is really just sort of a collection of other nodes, okay? So if we dive inside of the color node, I'm gonna hide this thing here. We see we've got this big network, this big clunky network of stuff that does all kinds of different things. If we zoom in, what we have is, we have this input geometry here. Now this is, let's look again, this is our sphere, and it moves, no big deal. Now, let's plug it in here, and we'll set that color to red. So the color node changes that to red, right? So does this make att or attribute create node that I used. So if we dive inside of the color node, let's start to explore and maybe get an idea of exactly what's happening here. So we have our input geometry that comes in, and then we have all of these different options because the color node actually gives you a bunch of different uh, possibilities. We can say we want that color to be constant. We could say that we want it to be random and it'll choose a random color. Uh, we could base it off of the bounding box. We can do all kinds of different stuff. I didn't need any of those features. I didn't need any of that extra operability for this particular example. So ultimately, all the color node is doing is creating that color attribute for you and giving it a value. It's just that the node, if you use just the color node, gives you a ton of different options and it sort of opens up. Here's these pre-built presets that you can use to define the color on that particular point. Well, it's the exact same thing if you use an attribute create node and say, yeah, I want to create this attribute called CD, because CD means color. And I'm gonna give it a value. Here I'm creating that value, and I'm saying, okay, that value is gonna be one. If I change that to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and one, we're just changing the color based off of the value that we're adding into that attribute CD, right? Uh, it can, uh, and you can use that, like, that's a very, Yes, it can be anything you want it to be. Simple answer is it could be anything that you want it to be. I could make this 50, and let's uh, go back here. We'll say zero, zero, zero. Now, let's go down and look at what's happening when we look at our geometry manipulation. So if we come all the way down, uh, sorry, I need to do that in a different setup. Let's keep the question. The question was, can the value of when you make your color, can the value be more than one? And yes, it can, it can be whatever you want it to be. So let's go ahead and change that. Let's make it, uh, I don't know, yeah, three is probably a much better, more practical thing so we can see the, the change. So look over here in the attribute spreadsheet. Let's come down to the attribute transfer. We're looking at our points, and as our sphere gets closer and closer, now visually, in the viewport, you're not gonna see it redder, like way, way, way redder, right? Red is red is one, that's a color, and we see that. But if you look in the geometry spreadsheet, you find those points here, Let's just sort these by value. Oh, sorry. Come on, mouse. There we go. So the CD, the first value in the CD vector, now it's fancy words for saying red, the red value, here you can see is now 2.136, whatever. So I can, and that's based off of, let's keep this in mind here, let's go back and I'm gonna change this value to like five, right? So we'll come back here after the attribute transfer has happened, and now we can see that the values on CD are now 3.5. So as I change the source attribute's value, the attribute transfer, you know, obviously ups that value when it transfers it over to the new points. So yeah, it can definitely be greater than one. It could be anything that you want it to be. It's not gonna make a huge visual impact to you in your uh, interface and in your viewport, uh, but as far as just managing data and being able to change it to make it do whatever you want it to, yeah, you can make those values anything that you want them to be. I'm sure there's some technical limit on how big those numbers can be, but I have no idea what that would be. I mean, it's huge. I wouldn't even think about it as a limitation. Yeah, 100%. Right, and the distance away from the original points will be five times more. All right, so zoom this back out. So 
the distance is being driven five times larger than it was when it was at a value of one. Right? The rotations, we gotta zoom in just a little bit to kind of see those rotations, but yeah, they're spinning like crazy. Right? And all that's based off of that one single attribute, that one single color attribute of red that we're using way up here. Right there, make CD red. So let's go ahead and I'll zoom out a little bit and you can see this change live, like right in the viewport. So there it is, giant, and we'll say, no, I'm gonna change that back to one. Boop. So that color value, that red value, as you change it, dynamically changes throughout the entire system. Again, that's, that's the procedural nature of Houdini. You're changing it in one place and it's filtering it through all of the other nodes that it affects. You've got one spot where you can make that change and get the effect like that all throughout the system, non-destructively. Yes, sir? A hundred percent. Yeah, um, that's exactly, well here, okay, this is a good example. That's exactly what's happening with this transform node. This is a very, very, very simple example. Right? But the sphere just moves from the top to the bottom of the scene. Well, all I'm doing here is I'm changing, if you'll look in the geometry spreadsheet, that sphere, because it's a primitive, only has one point that's defining the position of that sphere. And that position is changing over time right here based off of $F. Right now, $F means the frame number. So it's taking the frame number as the timeline moves through here and uses it to drive the position. Any time that you wanted to uh, do that, you could add $F into your equation. So for example, let's take the color and we'll make its value zero and we can, uh, oh, how do I want to do that? Let's do a plus $F, right? So the frame number itself and let's divide that by something like say five. So now watch the color of the sphere, right? We're gonna do, I'm gonna play this back kind of slow. We'll skip through the timeline. Um, and we can look at the value of the color. So right now the value is 0.2 in the red channel, right? So what that means, if we look at this, I can click on this and see that that expression I just wrote, when I click on the name, will show me what it evaluates to. So it's 0.2. Well, I'm on frame number one, and I've divided that frame number by five, 0.2. Right? So now I'm driving this attribute of the red color by the timeline, and as it gains through the timeline, once we reach five, of course, we should have a value of one in red. Right? Does that, I mean, does that help? Does that clarify that? Does it make sense how, that, how it's working? Um, I mean, you could, yeah, you could easily set keyframes on it. I mean, that's a piece of cake, yeah, I mean, it's, I could come in here and just, uh, let's go ahead and delete this channel and just set a keyframe, right? So at five, the value is one, and back here, I'll take the value and set it to zero, right? Channels and keyframes, and now I can uh, make that change. So now I've got keyframes, it goes from zero, until I reach that next keyframe, right? Here's the, here's the, the thing, with, and you can see that in like the animation editor, we can see the animation curve for that. Yeah, you can do, you can definitely do it that way. Uh, there's the animation curve for it. So yeah, you can definitely do it visually. That's, that's, that's definitely one way to go. It's, the problem is now you're dependent on that keyframe. So if I set that keyframe anywhere but here, um, I mean, I have to, yeah, I can go in and manually change it here and it does still push that information all the way through the system procedurally and keep changing it everywhere in the interface. Um, but it's not as procedural in nature as what you would if you were gonna use expressions. Expressions are a much easier uh, way to get about it once you understand the, the simple pieces of math that are behind it. I think I'm being kicked off stage. Three minutes, woo woo! Okay, awesome. Other attribute questions Yes, sir. Okay. 
CD is a built-in variable for the geometry in Houdini. Houdini knows that if you create an attribute called capital C little d, that it's going to change the color on the points. It's just a, it's a, it's a, I mean, CD is, is kind of a standard, um, what would you call it, a variable throughout, like, kind of the visual effects industry, CD is the variable for color. And Houdini's geometry says, okay, anytime I get an attribute called CD, I'm going to apply it to color. So in other words, if you rename that uh, from CD, like, let's go back to the scene view here real quick. I'm going to delete that keyframe here. Delete the channel. Um, so let's go ahead and turn that back to red. But it's CD is right. The value of one is feeding CD. Houdini just knows CD means color. If I change that to something different, I don't have color anymore. But if you look over in the geometry spreadsheet, I do have this avocado attribute. Okay. So I can use the avocado attribute now to drive everything else throughout the system. It doesn't have to be color. Here on my attribute transfer, instead of transferring uh, color, I can say, yeah, I want to transfer avocado. All right? So now down here where I'm copying this node, instead of CDR, I would use avocado. All right? So now I'm going to use avocado to start driving position and whatever. The thing is, the reason you use CD and the reason I use CD is because it does give you visual feedback in the viewport. When you, when you, uh, we were playing with the attribute transfers blend properties. And we were like, how big of a gradient do we want that to have as it feeds through the geometry? I have no way of seeing avocado. There's no visual representation of where that avocado is. I'd have to look in the geometry spreadsheet and go, yeah, I want 0 0.7432 to be at 0.2168. Nah. Use color. You can see it. When you see the color in the viewport, it gives you a much easier way to adjust the effect of those attributes and that attribute transfer. OK. I got I to gotta close it up, guys. Um, thank you guys for coming in. You're awesome. I hope you enjoyed. I hope it was helpful. Oh. And uh, I also want to take a quick second. Do I have, like, maybe a minute? Oh, I don't have audio on my stuff. Let me just tell you right now. Uh, Pluralsight has been working with side effects to make sure that we have a new way of being able to teach Houdini. And we're using skill paths to do it with. If you go to pluralsight.com slash side effects, we have this entire curated list of courses. There's like 150 plus hours of Houdini training on Pluralsight side. And I know it can be really annoying knowing where to start. So if you'll go to pluralsight.com slash side effects, there is a new skill path that will guide you from the very first day you open the interface and in intro to Houdini, all the way through like building advanced like technical director tools in VEX for pipelines for larger studios and stuff. So go check out the pluralsight.com side effects